Hello everyone, welcome to We Working Women live stream. My name is Vera Tsui and I am the CMO of We Working Women, North America's largest platform for Chinese women's personal and professional development. Every month, We Working Women invites extraordinary guests from different industries to join us and share their professional experiences, knowledge, and wisdom with our audience of over 100,000 subscribers. It's an opportunity for the We Working Women community to learn from the personal stories and career path of diverse professionals and a chance for global guests to connect with our dynamic network of global Chinese women. This month is Asian Heritage Month, and we wanted to invite an outstanding guest tonight from the Asian Canadian community as we reflect on the theme of Asian Heritage Month, continuing a legacy of greatness. Today, we are so happy to be joined by Tao Lam to talk about her story as an Asian Canadian, and more specifically, to hear her insights on raising your voice and creating your place as an Asian woman in multicultural society like Canada's. In celebration of Asian Heritage Month, We Working Women are offering a huge giveaway with the support of many amazing online businesses. And you can click the link in the chat box, enter to win over $7,000 value gifts and join us for the Asian Heritage Month giveaway campaign. So hi Tao, welcome to our live stream. Say hi to our audience. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Tao, you're exactly how I imagined a children's book author and illustrator. Like, <laughs> is it the bookshelf? In the back? <laughs> yes, and your background is like, it's like my, it's so cute. Everything is set up so cute and nice. So first, allow me to introduce you to our audience. So Tao Lam is an award-winning author and illustrator born in Vietnam. She came to Canada as a young child. Learning English was difficult and it was picture books that helped her understand this new world and ignited her passion for visual storytelling. After growing up in Canada, Tao went on to study at Sheridan College and built a career as an art buyer for an educational publishing company. In her work, she has the opportunity to work with thousands of different artists from all around the world. Of course, she is the author and illustrator of a number of award-winning children's books. She has been recognized by the Globe of the Mail, CBC, Kirkus Book Review, and New York Public Library has received multiple awards, including Best Book and Best Picture Books. Not only have her books been recognized for the beautiful and memorable art that she creates through collage with colorful and textured paper that children love, some of the stories also touch on the theme of identity, immigration, and living in a multicultural society. These themes are related to her personal experiences and I think will resonate with many of us in the We Working Women community. Today, we are very excited to have Tao as our guest to learn more about her personal story and experience. So again, welcome Tao. First of all, there are not that many writers and illustrators in our community. So I think our audience would be really wanted to know what you do for a living. So what is the life of being a children's book illustrator and writer like? <laughs> uh, it's very, uh, I live like a hermit. So I am usually at home working all the time. I, I, if I'm not at home working, I am taking care of my daughter. Uh, so, um, and I work a lot by myself because uh, as an author and illustrator, it's not a very uh, team project. Uh, the only people I actually communicate with is my editor and my publisher. So it's a very kind of lonely career. <laughs> Do, have you like imagined like when you like create, have you imagined like you talking to all like your future audience or readers? Um, no, usually... The only time I meet my readers is if I do a book, uh, a book signing or an event, if I'm invited to an event to do a reading. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't 
I haven't done a lot of that recently, obviously because of COVID, a lot of events have been canceled or just on Zoom. Uh, and so I do give presentations to schools and libraries. And uh, I just recently did my first corporate presentation, which was uh, pretty exciting. Uh, but a lot of times when I'm writing a book, I don't picture the audience. I usually picture what I am trying to say to my daughter or what I'm trying to solve myself. So each book is a problem that I'm, I'm trying to solve. Um, mm -hmm. That's how I tend to write. Okay. So was your career goal always to be a writer and a creator? You know, many of us of the Asian descent um, as immigrations feel pressure to go into certain professions, right? Like most of our parents, they want us to be, I don't know, professors, doctors, <laughs> you know, lawyers, <laughs> Uh, you know, yes. when it comes to jobs like very creative jobs, like musicians, artists, they all say like um, starving artists, you know. Yes. So was yes. your family always very supportive of your career choice? Uh, no. <laughs> no? I, I have a similar upbringing as probably a lot of you guys out there. Uh, my, my family was, they didn't discourage me, but... Uh, uh, there was a pressure to do well in school and there was a pressure to like keep my grades up and uh, the arts was sort of a hobby. And uh, I, and I remember at the end of high school when you had to decide what you wanted to do uh, for university or college. Um, I remember my dad going, you know, if you choose to go into the arts, will support you emotionally, but not financially, right? And so they were like, if you're gonna do the starving artist route, then you have to make sure that you are able to feed yourself and you have to make sure that you can pay the rent. And uh, I mean, they would have loved that I stayed home, but I'm also a very stubborn, Asian child and I was just like I'm I'm gonna show you I can do this um and so that that's kind of like they they respect my decision but like I said they will not support me financially so uh that's why I started off as an art buyer instead of going directly into the route of writing children's books because I wanted to make sure that I had enough money to take care of myself uh, financially and that I was able to move out because it was going to be hard if I'd lived at home right because right. every day they'll be like uh-huh you should have been a doctor <laughs> like you know <laughs> like that's that would be a constant like I told you so mm -hmm. so as soon as I was able to get out uh, and yeah I think I I in a way did kind of I can financially take care of myself but like every conversation with my parents now is like uh so when do you have another book like are you like basically <laughs> are you feeding yourself can you feed yourself can you pay the rent next week um so yeah that's yeah. like very asian parents yeah they're making sure they're you're on the <laughs> edge and they're trying to make sure you're on the always on the edge <laughs> yes yes but that that's also good right they, they yeah. give us the right amount of pressure to make who we are today right to make True. sure we have the right choice <laughs> that's that's a very positive way of thinking about it <laughs> we have to we have to <laughs> we're on our own anyways <laughs> yes so um you have authored and illustrated award-winning books mm -hmm. um so can you tell us about like where the inspiration comes from mm, i think most of it is from like my life experiences or things I remember feeling or problems I, I try to solve myself. Like um, the Tao book is a problem that I try, I was trying to figure out. And I read this article on um, an NPR about what happens when you mispronounce a child's name and how it affects them. And it really opened up my eyes to, and give words to what I was experiencing as a child, right? Because I, like as an Asian child, I just kind of took, 
took the bullying or took the teasing and just kept quiet, right? Because you're taught to just, you know, not cause a problem or, or, or stir. So, um, and so a lot of it was internal processing of like, oh, you know, people are picking on me, but I guess it's my fault because my name is difficult. So when I read this article, I really did sort of go, wait a moment, this is everything that they were describing was what I was feeling. And so it really helped me like therapeutically to write this book. And and I tend to do a lot of research when I write a book because in a way uh, I'm procrastinating because I, I, I get a little stage fright before I write. So I, I kind of research everything I could on the subject and, and learn before I write just to make sure that I um, can cover everything and explain everything that, that will um, help the readers also understand that they're not alone in, in this issue, right? So, yeah. yeah, so all of it is basically a lot of personal experiences or problems that I'm trying to solve internally. Wow. Um, I remember we just had a very small conversation before mm -hmm. the live stream about this book specifically, because <laughs> mm -hmm. as like, especially the first immigration, um, first generation immigration, we all had this experience, right? Because we all have our names, mm -hmm. right? I, I remember in your book is like Tao, T as Thomas, you know, H yeah. as Harry, and like, it's every name is so popular and simple but when mm -hmm. you put them together it's why it's so hard for them to even pronounce <laughs> yeah it's very true and I feel like right now it's very common for uh, uh, people who are immigrating to North America to to change their name or adopt a different name and for me that's kind of heartbreaking because we slowly all become Jennifer's and we slowly all become Thomas and the stuff that makes us unique is no longer there right I mean I because of my personal experience growing up with the name that is um, different um when I named my daughter, I really gave it a lot of thought because I was just like, I didn't want her to go through the same experience I did in which she was teased or bullied. And so I gave her a Canadian name. And, but I also made sure that her middle name was a Chinese name mm -hmm. because that's who she is. But also respecting that she is born in Canada and so she will have to deal with a different set of like issues, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I try to balance both worlds and not totally just make her white, <laughs> you know what yes. I mean? Yes. Uh, so I don't know. I, hopefully it works. I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> Ask her in 50 years. To see <laughs> she goes and see a therapist after this. <laughs> uh, but yeah. So yeah, even even as adults, when I read your book, I, I feel resonated, you know, mm -hmm. like that's exactly how I feel when mm -hmm. wherever where I go at Starbucks, when they try to get my coffee and mm -hmm. they're always like, Jian Shu, did yeah. I did I say it right? Like, right. how hard is it to say Jian Shu? Right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. Why do you have to say Jian Shu? <laughs> it's not Jian Shu. <laughs> <laughs> but it's I, I agree with you it's so important to keep your name your name resonate your 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 yourself mm -hmm. your person your personality and everything you stand for right mm -hmm. yeah so um let's talk about your art um in, in most of your books like your art has a lot of um very distinctive style you're using um the paper collage Mm -hmm. So how did you develop that style? Uh, when I was in college, uh, we were encouraged to experiment with different mediums. And one of the mediums I was experimenting with um, quilting with mm -hmm. fabric. Okay. And, uh, but then that eventually got really expensive for a student because you can't buy little patches of fabric back then. You had to buy like at least half a, half a yard. And so I, I tried to find a substitute that had the same patterns and textures. And I stumbled across uh, Japanese paper. 
mm. right? Uh, there's a, it used to be called a Japanese paper place down on Queen Street, but now it's called the paper place. And they had beautiful, beautiful papers that they imported from Japan. Um, but then eventually that got really expensive. <laughs> Remember, I'm a starving artist. And then so um, a scrap of paper is really inexpensive to to buy. And so I, I, I kind of moved the shift that way. And, and now I'm kind of shifting into making my own textures um, to work with. So that's how I got started on collage. Yeah, it's, that makes your book very special because most of the um, children's illustration book, they're mm-hmm. just like um, doodling, right? Like mm-hmm. painting, drawing, doodling. Mm-hmm. It's mostly just um, the ideas, the book, how they put up a story together. But mm-hmm. your book, it's the textures, right? The, mm-hmm. the, the, I, the way how you put people and the setup and the scene together. I remember last year, my daughter, this, my six-year-old daughter started mm-hmm. to learn art. And then her art teacher used this collage um, skill a lot Mm -hmm. to put like piece by piece by magazines, newspaper, clothes, whatever you can find to make art, to make a painting, meaningful painting together. And she really enjoyed it. Um, And then she started to develop more in real life, in daily life, right? She will say, oh, this is a really nice piece. I'm going to use it in my art. Right. I think um, this is really nice inspiration. Yeah, it's a great art form because it is very versatile and meaning like you can use anything, any fan object. And it's a great um, way to recycle uh, materials and kids of of all ages can do it. It's not something that you really need a skill uh, to do because every kid, like you said, in, in kindergarten start using scissors and glue and, and cutting up pieces of paper. And if you don't know how to draw a bike, you can find a picture of a bike and cut it out and use it as part of your art. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause I remember when I was growing up, we didn't have money for fancy paper, right? So a lot of the stuff I was cutting up was like newspapers or flyers you would get in the mail or like gift wrapping paper that's being reused. So it's a very, I feel like out of all the mediums out there for art, that it is one that um, you don't need a lot of skill nor money to do, right? So, Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. So you came to Canada when you were three years old um, from Mm -hmm. Vietnam, right? So it says in your bio that you and your family fled Vietnam. So how how was it that you came to Canada as a refugee? Well, after the Vietnam War, there was a lot of like hostility towards the supporters of of, uh, the Viet Cons. And so my dad was part of the army and his family his brothers were part of the army. And so at the end, they decided that um, for the safety of the family, they would uh, leave Vietnam. And like many other families, we escaped by boat. Um, and it was a, like, they, they split up so that if, you know, one person got caught, it wasn't the whole family that caught. So my mother um, had me and my cousin uh, my mother was like three months pregnant at the time. So, but she didn't tell anybody because she was afraid of being left behind. So uh, we escaped and uh, we were very lucky because um, I, when I was researching for the paper boat, uh, I actually read a lot of horror stories of people encountering pirates or their boats got sank at sea or they just uh you know destroyed by storm so there was a lot of very tragic stories and my family was actually really lucky because the only thing that happened to us was that the boat um our engine died and so we were just kind of floating aimlessly but um we were rescued by malaysian fishermen fishermen uh and so we were taken to malaysia where we were housed in a refugee camp for five months uh, before we were, um, well, we, we were accepted by the U.S., Australia, and Canada. Mm-hmm. And so my dad decided that he wanted to go to Canada. Um, 
and that so that's how we ended up in Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is like, do you still have any memories as oh, three no. years old? No. No, I, I, I have a fear of very deep water. <laughs> I think that's the only thing I remember. It's like, if I can't see the bottom of a pool, I start hyperventilating. Mm. Um, but I don't remember anything. And for the, for the book, I end up interviewing my parents and I end up interviewing my cousins. And, and so it was a lot of secondhand knowledge. And I did a ton of research for that, just like mostly out of curiosity. Uh, because like my parents didn't really talk about the war or how they escaped. And so I just had to kind of piece together all the information. Um, yeah. Wow. So have your mom ever like talk about the whole experience to you like growing up? No, no, nobody, <laughs> nobody talks about it. My, my, my dad is just like, well, why would you want to talk about it? Like, that's a terrible thing to talk about. Let's talk about the weather. Mm -hmm. um, my mom, the only thing that I've heard from my mom is that story about the ants and how, you know, she, uh, she rescued them as a little girl. And so when we were escaping, she got lost, right? And so she followed the ants and they led her to the boat that was waiting for us. But for her, because, uh, she's a Buddhist. And so she really believes in karma and right. And to her, the, because she rescued those ants as a little girl, she, uh, she thinks they rescued her back. Right. Mm. So she, she, that's how she explains war. Right. To, that's, that's what she chooses to believe. And so I thought that was really lovely because often when we think about war, you know, it's all about death and destruction, right? It's very rarely does somebody um, see it from a, uh, like something beautiful, right? Or something right. that if you're kind in your previous life, then it will come back to you. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I remember um, in my 20s, I traveled in uh, Vietnam again, because mm -hmm. I've, I've been to Vietnam when I was like in my teenager years. I couldn't remember much. Uh, and then uh, in my 20s, I went back to Vietnam. Um, so uh, during my trip, I met this um, family. So it's like a white family. They're Canadians mm -hmm. with an Asian, like Asian looking girl, like a teenage girl. So they were, we started talking because the way how I spoke English. So they thought I was also adopted, right? Because the girl was adopted. So, and then I find out that every year they took the girl back to Vietnam just so she gets to know her heritage. Oh, that's very That was a really nice thing to know. Yeah. And I get to hear their story, um, get to know them. And then they're like, what is your story? What's your heritage? I'm like, I'm just a traveler. <laughs> so they thought I went back to find my heritage as well. Right, right. But that, that's really really, really nice, like, because what happened um, for the war in history, um, families, they had to, um, your families is one of the, you know, like the fortunate ones yes. that get to survive and live on for a better life mm -hmm. in another country, but there are still families that couldn't, couldn't live on. Yeah, and a lot of those families actually had to separate, right, because, uh, there was only enough seats on the ship or a plane. Yeah. And so, so families were sacrificing, like making the sacrifice and sending their kid off to, they don't even know where their kid landed, right? My mm -hmm. cousin was the same, same way. She, uh, remember how I told you, like the family separated when they were escaping. Mm -hmm. So she, she was with my mom and I, and her family, she had four brothers, her mom and her dad, they all went a separate route and they end up getting caught. So they never left Vietnam. They were caught. And her dad, uh, my uncle, he was in prison. He was in prison for uh, treason and stuff. And so he was in prison for, I think, 12 years. Wow. And the whole family. And she never saw her family. So she left when she was, uh, she left when she was eight. So she never saw her family until she was like 23 mm -hmm. when she, wow. she saved enough money to go back to Vietnam to visit. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the, 
her dad was let out of prison. So it, it's like stories like that, that really just make you kind of like, you know, take a pause. Right? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so um, what, what was it like growing up here in Canada, you know, mm-hmm. at that time as an Asian Canadian, you know? Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't think it was bad. Like, Uh, like as a kid, you tend to look at things from a different perspective. And so um, I, I remember my parents worked really hard. I think like many Asian families that start all over, they have like two, three jobs or working night shifts, day shifts, like doing stuff on the side. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I was lucky because the neighborhood we grew, uh, we grew up in is Parkdale which, you know, is not the best neighborhood. But in the 80s, it was a hub for like many immigrants. And it's not just immigrants from, from Vietnam. Mm-hmm. There were, I remember like going to school with immigrants from India like, or from Africa. And it was just so th- you weren't the only one that looked different, mm-hmm. right? So it was a very mixed group. Uh, of kids that are all all their families that were starting over Mm -hmm. so you didn't feel left out Um, so that I enjoyed that part and like I said like as a kid you kind of look at everything differently and because we were in Parkdale a lot of those families were not wealthy so you really had nobody to compare to everybody everybody wore shoes that had holes in them everybody had like you know brought their own lunches uh, and had different foods. And so you didn't feel out of place. And I don't think I felt out of place until I end up, uh, we end up moving to Mississauga Mm -hmm. because my family wanted to get out of Parkdale, right? Because it was starting to get really, um, uh, it's a neighborhood that is struggling, right? And so we, we went to Mississauga hoping that they wanted us to grow up in the suburbs and, And that's when I, I started noticing the difference because once you move into the suburbs, it was like, you know, wealthier family, even though they were middle class, it's still wealthier, right? Yeah. But to our family. And then it's a lot more Canadians there. So a lot more white people. And, and so it's, it's something you start noticing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, for me, I, I, Because the first year, like the first couple of years we moved here in Canada, we, we lived in a suburbs, you know, area in, in Montreal, right? Because right. it's all like a well-settled neighborhood. And they're mm-hmm. all mostly locals. Like nobody is local here in Canada, right? Everybody is immigrants. But they were all settled in for generations. Right. So it's, um, it's a hard for my son, like my first son, he, for him to blend in. Mm. Right, so he had a lot of issue to deal with. So he had a lot of questions about mm. race, about culture. Mm. You know, like all, all the issues he brought home from school. We have to face it every day. I had to talk to him a lot. I remember I spent hours and hours every day talking to him, just making sure that he's okay. Right. But then the second, um, my twins, because they were mm. born here, and then. There's no issue for them to blend in, right? Because right. they just grow up with the, everybody else. They don't feel that they are different. Right. They right. feel like everybody is the same. They just grow up with everyone. So I think even though my son moved here when he was five years old, it was still really young, but still he was facing the same problem mm. as an adult. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it's hard. Yeah. So now you are. A uh, young mom. <laughs> You're a mom of a young daughter. Your daughter is 28, right? Yes, she is. Yeah. So, how do you see that Canadian society has changed now? Well, I think it's different for her. Like, I feel like so much has happened in our society. Like, even in the last seven years, like we now are very aware of all the different the diversity. Or what's the current word now? Uh, inclusiveness. Yes. yes. Inclusive? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and like not only in race, but in uh, in culture, in gender, in as like every, we're heading towards where 
everything and anything is accepted. Mm -hmm. uh, so, which is great because uh, she is growing up where she's like, well, it's, it's like, I don't feel any different. Mm -hmm. I don't see anything wrong with you. I don't see anything wrong with me, mm -hmm. right? Uh, there are still some some areas of sensitivity and I think it's more um, it has to for me I, it's more financial like she noticed the difference in class uh, instead of uh, in her her culture mm -hmm. right like most of her friends are Canadians mm -hmm. um, or Europeans mm -hmm. but, uh, and she is the only Asian one and so, but she, to her, it's like, I don't, I didn't even know this. Yeah, so I was different. She doesn't right? even notice. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But she does notice that, you know, somebody uh, can afford something and we can't. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, cause I, I'm a single mom. So mm -hmm. there's, there are, there are things that I can't afford compared to like a two house income. Right. Mm -hmm. And plus I write children's books. <laughs> like I can't. <laughs> I can't compete with a doctor or a lawyer, right? I'm a starving artist. Yeah. And so those are that is what she noticed, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, because this month is Asian Heritage Month, mm -hmm. my son's school, they have this um, social study too. But for mm -hmm. the past week, he did uh, research on me, <laughs> oh, nice. on, on us. So he actually asked me, um, like he took home a questionnaire asking me a bunch of questions like, why did you choose Canada, not USA, not other country for immigration? You know, mm -hmm. like, what was the big difference? What was the difficulties you're facing? Yeah. Like, like interviewing me, right? And then I, I started to see that, you know, like, oh, this is really like a legacy you're passing on mm -hmm. to the next generation for them to see, oh, this is really really different um you're making a different but also making them see who you are where's your yeah. root is from right no, yeah that's very true yeah so we were talking about two of your um your books mm -hmm. um so tonight i'd like to specifically talking about two of your books my favorite yeah. books um that touch on your personal stories and heritage the first one is the paper bolt uh, mm -hmm. that we just talked a lot about. So mm -hmm. it talks about the refugee experience, right? right. So um, why do you feel that it was so important um, for you to tell that story? And what is the message you wanted to communicate to your audience through this book? Mm, I think it, I think it's uh, the reason I did it. It's way more personal than me writing it with an audience in mind. Like I said, like a lot of these books are, it's very therapeutic for me. Like it's, it's like cheap therapy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I wrote The Paper Boat cause I was going through a divorce mm -hmm. and I, my, like, you know, my family was falling apart and I was just like devastated. And I was just trying to figure out like, you know what did I do wrong? Like, what are all these, like steps that got me here, like what decisions my parents made for me to be where I am. Like, you know, I was trying to figure it all out. And then I had Maddie and I was just like, okay, well, like how do I explain family to her? And how do I give her that anchor that tells her like, you know, our family actually goes, or is, is really strong. Like the foundation is really strong because it goes, way way back and we survived all these difficulties so we can survive a war and we can survive crossing the south china sea and we can survive a refugee camp then we can survive this and we can start over mm -hmm. because that's what most families did they start with it over and so that's what i was doing i was starting over and and rebuilding everything so uh I wrote, that's why I wrote that book. And it, it's also, it helped distract me from my problems, right? And it gave me, um, you know, sometimes when you listen to other people's problems. So all these stories I was hearing about like 
people's journey and their tragedies it just made me more grateful for where I was and how I got here. So that was why I wrote the book. But like after writing the book, like I got a lot of feedback from people, like people who were in the same, same, uh, had the same history as me, you know, uh, second generations whose parents came over by boat. And so I'm glad that it, um, it helped or, or gave them a voice uh, to tell their story. Uh, so, um, but it's like two different things. Often I write for myself and I'm very lucky that the audience or the reader um, have received it and and it helped them or entertain them in some way. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I truly agree that writing or like creating is a very private experience. It's a very personal experience, right? Mm -hmm. But however, your readers, they get to interpret in their own way. They get to interpret with their own story, right? Mm -hmm. They get to, you know, like collide with their own story, their personal experiences. And that's why it's really beautiful. Mm, thank you. Yeah. And, and when this paper book, um, the paper bold book is out, um, was it like a very big um, hit in your community? Because mm. you did a lot of research on your, you know, families and how you got here um, for your, your parents' generation. Um, how was their reaction when they read the book? I, my parents have never read any of my <laughs> <laughs> that's how supportive they are <laughs> they're like it's kids book we don't read kids book no they say as long as you got the check we're okay <laughs> oh, that's um no they uh yeah i've never i've never given them any of my books because i for me it's a personal it's a personal experience it's a it's my personal creativity and so hmm. you know, some ha sometimes often when you give something to a parent uh if they're very critical they can wreck that experience mm. for you and I think that's very common among Asian <laughs> parents that's true. and so I didn't want them to poo-poo on my book <laughs> <laughs> so I was just like yeah no no thanks um at, for as in like I don't really interact with people. So I haven't really heard, uh, I've heard from like bloggers or parents that are, are Vietnamese, but as like, I don't, I, I'm not part of a Vietnamese community, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, is kind of embarrassing for me to say. Um, but uh, yeah. Mm. <laughs> I, I discovered that uh, your book, some of your books were recommended by a lot of teachers, actually, because they have a lot of new immigrant students, right? That's very true. I did hear a lot from teachers and librarians uh, that mostly in the U.S. where they have a lot of immigrant students that they have recommended the book for. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially the book Tao, the one the one we just mentioned, right? Okay. That talks about the challenge of fitting in when you have the different name that is hard for English speakers to pronounce and even eating different food, you know, have celebrate different festivals, different holidays, right? Mm -hmm. I remember there was um, the first year <clears throat> we were here. It was really funny. It was the Chinese, um, Chinese New Year because in our tradition, we eat the dumplings with the um, wrapping the, the coins inside, yes. right? And whoever mm -hmm. eats the coins ha has the good luck for the next year. Mm -hmm. So my dad was living with us at that time, so he didn't know. So he packed those um, New Year dumplings from my son's lunchbox. Mm -hmm. And my son took the lunchbox the next day to school and he was eating and he was spitting out the coins and the teacher got panicked. Right, the oh, teacher called me and no. took away his lunch immediately and called me and said, this is a very dangerous thing. Oh, uh, no. A hazard, right? He might choke on the coin. Oh, no. I, I had to explain. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. It's a culture thing. It's our Chinese New Year, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, next time you have this culture celebration, you have to let me know. I'm like, oh. my dad didn't know. You know? Like, right, right. Grandpa, grandpa didn't know. So uh. that's the culture 
culture difference, right? Yeah, no, no. I uh, that's kind of insensitive in a way of the teacher. Like, I don't know. Because no, you know, like <laughs> Chinese New Year, because it's in Lunar Year, we never had this um really like day offs or holidays. It's just mm-hmm. do a regular school day, right? Mm-hmm. So like. Does it like based on this book? Does it like influence how you parent your your daughter in any way? We tried. I try to celebrate every holiday that is、uh, Asian, and and、uh, and because well, for me, I love food. So any excuse, and I feel like food is the best way to. Teach anybody about culture because、uh, I heard this great saying just recently.、Uh, does anybody watch Feed Phil on Netflix? So he just said, re- "Yeah." So the new season is out. I'm so excited.、Um, but he has he said his saying is like, "If you can open a mouth, you can open a mind." Right.、Mm-hmm. So I feel like food is the easiest way, a gateway. To introduce somebody to a culture, and so that's what I do with Maddie is in- introducing food and like food that's tied to a celebration, food that's tied to a, a story, food that's tied to a history, and and that's how we're learning, right? So,、um, yeah, food. <laughs> you also cook a lot. I I am.、Um, I'm not bad of a cook. She doesn't spit my food out, so that's a good sign.、Uh, it's the problem is I'm very busy,、oh. right? And so I don't get enough、uh, time to cook. And sometimes, you know, when you're cooking for two people, if you're making dumplings, you're eating dumplings for weeks because you can't make time like little stuff. But I I have a collection of cookbooks. Like recently, that's my new thing is. I've been reading cookbooks from different Asian countries、mm-hmm. because cookbooks have also changed a lot. Like cookbooks used to be like just the recipes, but now you get a personal story、yeah. and a personal history within that.、Mm-hmm. Um, so I have like a collection of like Asian cookbooks because you know it, it's another gateway to learn about the culture, right? So,、yeah. is it on your list that you're gonna maybe create a children's book about cooking? <laughs> mm, I have thought about it because I, for me, food is very tied to memories. Eh, so I have a lot of memories with my parents on different dishes. Right, like my mom, instant noodle. Okay, my, <laughs> my mom used to work the night,、uh, the day shift. Yeah. So she would come home at midnight, and if I was still doing my homework, she'd be go make an instant noodle. But of course, she would like gourmet it up. She'll put like bean sprouts and eggs and shrimp and like. And I remember she'll 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 be like, "You want an instant noodle with me?" And I'd be like, "No." But by the time she has it cooked and on the table, I was like eating out of her bowl, right? <laughs> so, so then she kind of clued in and she said, even though I said no, she made two portions because she knows <laughs> I'm gonna be eating with it. You never mention it's a fancy version of things to do. So yeah, so that's that. Like, I would love to write a story, something like that.、Mm-hmm. That would be that would be really beautiful. I, I I'm a big foodie. My kids they love eating. I I love to cook all the time. I I do believe that cook like food is a a way to open. Doors to different cultures.、Mm-hmm. That's also the biggest fun part when you travel to different places.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I I、uh, watched one of your interviews on you know, YouTube.、Mm-hmm. Uh, so I heard that you mentioned in an interview that、um, you can't figure out who you are if you don't know where you're from. So as an Asian who grew up in Canada and now as the mother of a second generation Asian Canadian, right? So how、yeah. important do you think this is for、um, Asian Canadian children? Um, um I want to say it's very important, but I'm a very bad example of that,、uh, just because I don't have the time nor energy to 
do everything. I mean, like when Maddie was born, I was just like, yeah, she's going to learn Chinese and she's going to learn Vietnamese and she's going to speak French and she's going to speak English. You know, like I was, I had all these dreams and goals for her and uh, nope. <laughs> it's like at the door. Because uh, reality sets in, right? Like you, you, you have so many, t- so much time in the day and so much energy you know, to drive your kid from this lesson to this lesson and and next thing you know, they grow up really fast, right? That's true. And so you don't, you're like, oh, um, is it too late to learn Chinese? Is it too late to learn Vietnamese? And because it's just me, uh, like I, I've instructed my parents, I like mm-hmm. speak Vietnamese with her. And my mom's like, I try speaking the Vietnamese to her and she just looked at me weird. So I just went back to English, right? <laughs> Which is kind of funny because my mom's English is not very good. So my my daughter often corrects her. I'm like, your Vietnamese is better than your English. You should just stick to Vietnamese. Um, I don't know. And I think most we get tired and uh, I want to say for me, lazy. And mm-hmm. it's just easier and quicker for me to just think in English or, you know, yell at her, don't touch the knife in English. Then instead of in Vietnamese, like, I don't know how to say knife. <laughs> Let's look that up, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. So what what advice do you have for, you know, parents who really want to support their children in this way? Because in a way, you kind of support your daughter. You know, you, you're writing a book. That's a way that to show your daughter, you know, like, it's a, it's a way, like, to demonstrate your own way of parenting and culture and stuff right so mm-hmm. like for us we can't really like write a book create a book like what should we do mm, I don't know I mean like I try to like the library is a great source like you you may not uh, be a writer but there's lots of writers out there. And uh, lately I've noticed there's a lot of Asian writers. The lady who won the uh, Koldo Award, which is a big American, uh, North American author, author, children's book author award Mm -hmm. is an Asian, Andrea Wang, uh, The Watercress, which I totally recommend to everybody. I'm not getting any percentage from her sales, but it is a, beautiful book about her experience growing up in North America and uh, and her family's history of like the femme in China. Mm. So it, it's absolutely gorgeous, totally worth checking out. But yeah, there's a lot of books out there and there's way more books about Asian culture now than there was when I was growing up, uh, you know, and we have the internet now and Everybody is within touching distance. Uh, there's lots of help out there if, if you want to learn about something. Yeah. It's just depending on whether you're determined or have the time or energy to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. The other, I, I, I truly agree. Like compared to even like six, seven years ago, mm-hmm. I, I do like I go to the library with my kids every week. Like we go to a library every week, we get a bunch of new books, come home and read them and exchange. Mm-hmm. And um, my kids will like always like explore new books about Asian culture, especially mm-hmm. my daughter. And she will just like one day she, she discovered this book about how to make bao. Ooh. And she's like, oh, mom, we have to learn this, you know, like this library book. We only have 10 days and then we have to learn this and we have to return this. I'm like, <laughs> All, all the time like why do I have to learn this <laughs> it's like I have to learn you have to teach me you have to right. follow the steps you know right. and then the, that's that's true that's a really good um, library is a really nice resource um to do you read a lot with your daughter yeah we we do it's one thing that I uh, I never had growing up and so when I had a kid I was just like this this is going to be a priority for me mm-hmm. and for some reason like like you said like uh, hearing from a book or hearing from somebody else other than your parents it becomes more like I totally believe this person <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. but if you you were teaching them they'll be like I don't know I don't know if you're legit right so yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, I think I know the book you're talking about. Is it Amy Wu? Yes. 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 Yes, I'm actually a very good friend with Charlene, oh, the yeah. illustrator. So oh, yeah, wow. they have, it's a great series of books that uh -huh. normalizes Asian people, right? Yeah. Like, um, I was on a panel recently and one of the Jewish authors, uh -huh. she was just like, you know, every time people write about Jewish people, they write about the Holocaust or they write about like some tragedy. Why can't they write about us getting a a dog or us going on a trip like why can't it be normalized like yeah. so i think that's the goal is to normalize diversity like you're seeing different cultures different skin colors different genders just in, so that it doesn't become special yeah. like it's normal asian people do drive cars yeah. very well i think <laughs> right <laughs> like you know what I mean? Like, it's normalized seeing difference, right? So, yeah. Yeah. and we we all have the same problem on a daily basis, right? Mm -hmm. Like everyone else. Yeah, we're not we're not just the we're not just our history or our past. Oh well, I don't want to say that because we are, you know, our history and our past does fill us. But what I mean is our tragedies, right? right? It doesn't have to define us. Yeah, yeah. I actually agree. And speaking of which, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of Asians coming to a new country, you know, feeling they are trapped or boxed into a stereotypes, you know, mm -hmm. and they have a lot of hard time to find their own unique voice. Mm -hmm. Like you find your way, you know, like speaking out your history, your voice, you know, like your feelings being mm -hmm. out there. Um, and you have done such um, so much to raise your own voice with your own style and confidence. Right. Mm -hmm. So what advice do you have for, you know, young women out there? Because uh, on our platform, we have a lot of like young professionals, women mm -hmm. that um, they how they follow their own career dreams? Mm. Well, my motto is always try. It never hurts to ask. The worst somebody can say to you is no. And I'm shameless about asking. I will ask anything and everything. And I will, uh, because nobody is a stronger advocate for your, your I don't want to say dreams, because somebody recently told me like dreams, people just dream about it. They don't actually make it happen. So your goals, right? Like if you want something, go for it. If it fails, go for it again and just ask and try. And like I, I've always wanted to write children's books, like since I knew what the concept of books were. And I only started writing children's book when I was 36. And that's only after the company I worked for went bankrupt. And I was kind of like, you know, pushed in against the wall and go, okay, I need to make money. Otherwise I move home with my parents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, that kind of desperation where you got nothing to lose. And I, that's how I treat every project. The next project is not a guarantee. So I, I treat every project as in like, this is my last project. I'm desperate to like get the next paycheck. And so I have to work hard to pitch for the next book, right? Mm -hmm. It's hustling, constantly hustling. My daughter knows that too. And I'm like, mama's working. She's like, no, mama's hustling. <laughs> right? Because she knows like I am the only person who's going to like bring in the paycheck. Uh -huh. the moment so right. so yeah just hustle be shameless uh -huh. do it <laughs> i love it because it's a it's a big challenge for the for for us as asians right yeah it's very this, like, true self-awareness of being shamed of like speak out or in you know like just stand up and ask something like even something very simple and we're like ah you know like maybe just you know i'll just be quiet Right, right. No, I totally understand that because I was raised that same way. But for me, I just sort of like, I think I, I grew up and I did everything I did. I got good marks. I like, 
uh, listen to my parents. I like never went to a party. I never drank. I, I still don't drink. I never like smoked, you know, like I always never wore a skirt higher than my knees, you know, that, that sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, it, that doesn't really, that didn't get me anywhere, mm-hmm. right? It didn't make me a better person. It didn't make me uh, like get me a job. It it didn't make my family stay intact, right? At, at the end of the day, I was still like a divorced single mom. And what am I going to do, right? Mm-hmm. I, I'm going to hustle and make sure that I can take care of my daughter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We have a question in the live stream chat box <laughs> since we mentioned about um, stand up and speak out. <laughs> mm-hmm. Our audience asked about how did you get the courage to have a career your parents didn't approve of? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of the kind of person who, if you tell me I can't do something, I will find a way to prove you wrong. Because wow. I feel like that it's, I use anger. Uh, as a motivating tool Uh, so if you tell me I can't do something then uh, I will prove you wrong Mm -hmm. I mean that's how I I kind of built my career because this day is between us and the hundred thousand viewers out there (laughs) but I was going through like when I went through divorce court Mm -hmm. I remember the judge he was sort of saying well you know what I think you're really talented as an artist, uh, but you really should get a full-time job. You should get a job, was what he said. So he didn't consider what I was doing, a career. And he says, you know what, you should really think about your your daughter and you should go get a job. You shouldn't be asking your ex for money. And I was just like, hello, <laughs> like, excuse me, this is also his child, right? And so, and that really made me angry, right? And so I was just like, you know, it's very unfair for women out there, mm-hmm. uh, whether it's in career or family. And like even uh, the information session for like when you go through the court process, you, I was in a room with 50 other women. There was only one husband that was in there. Mm-hmm. And all the women were like, well, I'm kind of stuck at home. I can't move out. I don't have money because I'm reliant on him. How do I get a lawyer? How do I move out? Because I'm scared. You know, like, come on. You know? Yeah. So I feel like we have to fight for ourselves and we really have to support each other. Mm -hmm. Um, Because who else will, right? Mm -hmm. True. True. Very nice. That's very encouraging. Um, thank you so much, Tao. I read at truly on behalf of my kids, <laughs> personally, and on behalf of my kids, we really love your book and we can't wait to read more of your book coming. Thank you. And that is a job. <laughs> that is a job. A yes. Very, very respectful, loving job that you're doing. <laughs> thank you. So, um, Thank you, Tao, again for coming and join us on live stream. Um, mm-hmm. Thank you for our audience to stay tuned all night and listen to our stories. Don't forget that in celebration of Asian Heritage Month, uh, we are offering a huge giveaway with the support of many amazing online businesses. You can click the link in the chat box, enter to win over $7,000 value gifts and join us for the Asian Heritage Month giveaway campaign. So once again, thank you. And uh, we hope to see you very soon, uh, maybe in person next time. We're going to invite you over for an event and Thank we can do a reading club for the kids. <laughs> <laughs> sure, that sounds lovely. That's so, um, good night, good night. and our audience. Bye. Bye.